Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitchell Lepp. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, this is Pete A. Turner. And tonight, our special guest judge is Matt Menard. He was a Marine counterintelligence agent who had defended our freedom in Iraq and Afghanistan and now serves and protects around Syracuse. And tonight, he's going to judge the rounds between the challenger in the red corner, the fourth album by Metal Giants Metallica, the first one with Jason Newstead, and Justice for All. It faces off against... What else could be the champion against Mighty Metallica? In the blue corner, Let It Bleed by the Rolling Stones. Ooh, that is heavy. For our pre-fight analysis, we go to Richard Lackey. Richard, what do you say? This week's album fight uh, is a battle between two bands that had at one point in each of their careers been considered the greatest working band in the world. We've used words like titans before, and it definitely applies here to these two. So what are we looking at? Up first is the Rolling Stones' 1969 release, Let It Bleed. It marks the 8th British and 10th U.S. studio album for the band. Don't ask me what the hell that means, it's just a little piece of trivia to put in your pockets for later. It's a continuation of the band's exploring their more blues-inspired sound, and the album has bookends with what I think are probably their two best, or at least my favorite, Rolling Stones songs in Gimme Shelter and You Can't Always Get What You Want. And having two strongs like that bookend an album makes it very, very tough to beat. Um, It's up against Metallica's 1988 offering and Justice for All. It's the band's fourth full-length studio album and the first without legendary bassist Cliff Burton and the first with Jason Newstead in his place. This is all but considered a concept album as it contains themes of political injustice through the lens of war and nuclear proliferation. It's also the album that brought the band out of a very niche trash metal fan base and into the view of more mainstream audiences when the band finally decided to do their first music video for one. Both the video and song are masterpieces. Thematically and musically, this album is top-notch, but it is hurt a little bit by some who don't care for the mix. And I'll admit I never really noticed it until it was pointed out to me, and now it's kind of one of those things that I always hear Um, While not a game changer, it does hurt it compared to like a true master work like Master of Puppets. So this fight is a tough one for me. So I'm glad I have the numbers. And what do the numbers say? Well, this is going to be a barn burner, people. Looking at the more popularity-related numbers, and they point to a 5-4 win for Metallica. Looking at the critical numbers, and they point to a 5-4 win for the Rolling Stones. If Metallica wins, it will be because it has a co- it's a coherent album with consistently good songs throughout. If the Stones win, it will be because the highs are so high that they outweigh the consistency of And Justice for All. So personally, I predict Metallica five rounds to four because I think the middle rounds will belong to Metallica. Um I think we'll more than likely see some fierce debate between the judges, and my prediction there is they're going to be split two to one this week. That's all for the numbers and for my predictions. Back to you. All right, Richard. Well, yeah, the system, it's evolving. Yes, the system evolves. Patent pending. Yeah, we're going to have to get that thing active. All right, well, let's jump right in, Matt. If you'll take round one, it's Gimme Shelter versus Blackened. Well, how'd you score it? Right off the bat, how did I score it, or what did I think of the song? Well, go for either one. Whichever one you think is uh, going to serve dramatic effect. I need a drum roll. Do we get that, that sound bite? Okay. All right. We'll pipe one in. Uh, I did uh, 10-9, Gimme Shelter, uh, Blackened. Okay. How'd you re- reach that conclusion? You got Gimme Shelter. I mean, it's your... It's got your foot tapping, you know? It's one of those songs, you hear that, you start tapping your feet. It's very iconic. 
you start thinking about the, the you know the problem highlights of Vietnam War, children. That's kind of what the song encompasses at the time. I really, I mean, I mean, I should have caveated this, but I'm a huge metal fan. So this was a very, uh, this is a very, <laughs> yes, you were very conflicted. interesting me. So uh, you look at Black and this apocalyptic. She pretty much talks about the world ending. And it's the, one of the songs, I think it's the only song on the album credited to actually, you just said Jason Newstead, like he was new to the band. Uh, he actually wrote that one. I really like the, the song. I like the intensity. Uh, I love the guitar layering. But again, I can't get past the, Give Me Shelter did it for me. You know, when I'm, I'm listening to that song, it, it stays in my mind. That song's kind of woven into our fabric. Yeah, actually, but, uh, that's yeah. an ex- excellent way to put it. It, it, it is. It, I'm probably going to use the word iconic a lot tonight. And that, I mean, given the Stones, it's just their prestige. They are. They are icons. You can't, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. I had to give it to the Stones in this one because of pure legend status. And, and that's one of their, you know, one of the go-to songs for the Stones. Not being too familiar with the, 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 right. the uh, lesser known songs of them. This is one I actually already knew uh, and I was familiar with. Being the metal fan, though, I still gave uh, Metallica and I. All right, Pete. Yeah, I, I went the same way. This give me shelter. Here's the thing with this song. It doesn't even belong to the Stones anymore. It belongs to everybody. It, it's so iconic. <laughs> it, it nails down that era. Yep. And then if I was gonna make a couple of notes. It's the shimmering guitar that you know, just that lick, and then the the cool percussion that rick rick. I love that sound. And of course maracas. Anytime you bring maracas into a, a rock and roll song. And I really liked the way that Keith's solo was really lyrical. It was almost like a second voice in the song. It's one of the greatest songs that the Stones ever created. And, and uh, I don't see how Blacken can beat it. Look, here's the thing with, that I realized about Injustice for All. The mix is terrible. And I, I checked it with Wes maybe. And he said, yes, the mix is terrible. It drives him crazy. And that's what he does for a living. So I, I get it. We're... You know, it's the apocalypse. There's a ton of punk rock. There's a ton of Sabbath in this. It's absolutely Metallica, but it's just nothing compared to Gimme Shelter. This is 10 Nine Stones all the way. Okay. I scored at 10 Nine Stones too, but here's why I was so conflicted about it as Matt was. was I am a big fan of Jason Newstead. Yeah. I'm a big fan of brad gillis i'm a fan of the guy who's not afraid to say i'm gonna step into some big ass shoes those shoes need filling the world needs those shoes filled we're in the middle of a tour give me the ball and jason newstead for the sheer size of his balls (laughs) for sure gets really i mean you know to to replace cliff burton come on And he said, not only am I going to do this as ably as I can, I'm not going to betray the memory and the tribute to Cliff Burton, and I'm going to write a song that's going to lead off the first album that I play on. And that's awesome. And I want to extend as much praise and as much... I love Jason Newstead, and I love Metallica. Blackened, not only is it a great album opener, it's one of the great double bass drumming songs ever. I love Lars Ulrich, too. And I like the movements that make it a classic Metallica song. But classic Stones, like Gimme Shelter, you know, Pete, to say that that song belongs to the universe now doesn't belong to the Stones anymore, that's really what it is. Uh, Classic Stones beats classic anything. And this is a great song. You know, this is Blackened is a great song running up against the ocean. And so you can't really, you know, but. They still earned a nine. They still didn't get knocked down. Absolutely. They so, stood their ground. Yeah. Round two was Love in Vain versus Injustice for All. How'd you score it, Pete? Well, look, I looked at Injustice for All, and I said, okay, let's just bring it heavy again. Let's see what happens, right? You, you ran into a monster round in the first round. So what do we have? We have, you know, the, I, my teen self is now being recognized. I feel it, you know. I, I'm looking for my black jeans. I'm trying to get my neck loose so I can bang my head a little bit and and if you like metal, this is a song that you play to show off to your friends that maybe don't quite get it. Maybe they're punk rock guys. And you're like, this is what you have to understand. This is not an entry song. This is like where I need you to be up here. And I think it's great. Love in Vain is, is uh, well, this is a contrast in styles between the two bands. You know, you got Young Mick selling the blues and, and the guitars right there with them. But it's also a cover of Robert Johnson. And, and as much as I love 
covering Robert Johnson and giving that guy all the all the credit and everything because he look all rock and roll is the progeny of Robert Johnson all of it including Metallica this is a cover against an original piece and there's just not enough separation with Love and Vain from Injustice for All so I've got this round Metallica 10-9 okay I didn't score it that that same way I, I mean I did I came up with the exact same score but I didn't Doc Love in Vain for being a cover. The Stones have always been wide open about the fact that they played some old blues and packaged it up to sell back to the Americans who forgot it had been been an American art form to begin with. So this is that concept at its best and and it's a pretty good, you know, pretty good cover and I think that uh, for them to have pulled it off this well, I enjoy it a lot. And Justice for All is a melodic beauty. It's just like, you know, it's a raven-haired, dark, dark-eyed dark girl <laughs> who's going to do nasty things to you. And, you know, it starts off almost like a Stones song. And one of the things I really liked about comparing these two songs was that factor. I mean, the beginning of Injustice for All, to me gives the indication of the Stones' influence, which, as you pointed out, is really Robert Johnson's influence. Uh, But it's updated by some rough-and-tumble kids who wanted to take Mick Jagger swag to the next level, and they did. And they did it with black leather pants on, goddammit. One of my favorite Metallica songs, I scored a 10-9. What did you Um, do, Matt? I went 10-9, Metallica, Rolling Stones, and this is why... Uh, Love in Vain, great. Again, I, I agree, it's a, it's a good cover, but it is a cover. So originality, I kind of took off for that. It's a bluesy song. It, I love the blues. I love the the bass lines in there. I don't want to say it falls flat to me, but it's it's very basic. And on its on its own, on its face, that's great. Uh, and Justice for All, aside from being uh, probably a little long on the long side. It's uh, just over nine minutes long. To echo you, I think it, it's very melodic. It, it just it gets in your head. The interludes, the lyrics, I, I mean, the lyrics mean something. I, it just, to me, there's more substance in Injustice for All versus Love in Vain. You follow what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's, absolutely. Um, yeah, for sure. And, and I think I did that a lot in this in this this album fight here this is definitely opened my eyes to looking at music a different way um <laughs> so yeah yeah it is it's, it's fun it's, huh? you get into it and you kind of go back and forth like i really love this song and i love the blues but what, what am i going to base the song on and, and off of substance I, I i did uh 10 9 metallica yeah substance wins a lot of rounds it's, that's it right sneaks it you know mm-hmm. it is it, it when it's thick it's overwhelming Round three was Country Honk versus Eye of the Beholder. Now, you know, Honky Tonk Woman is a tune from the Great American Songbook, and Country Honk is the slice of prairie Americana with womanly hips that bore it. You can smell the shine and fiddle varnish, and the hayseed is undeniable. Eye of the Beholder is a formidable song, and one of Metallica's melodic compositions that I really enjoy, but... Uh, interestingly, it's one of the songs that when I hear Lars play it today, I like his playing even better. I think his playing has seasoned beautifully. Maybe my ears are getting just as old as his are, but I just feel like his feel on Eye of the Beholder when it was originally recorded is uh, it seems a little young compared to how he plays it now. It's just... He seems to be more settled. He seems to more be more driving of the groove in a way that's uniquely his. And I really, uh, and I really like the song, and I like the way he plays it. But I like the way he plays it better now. He still retains the chops, but his his pockets gotten deeper. Comparatively, though, Country Honk has roots, and it wins the arm wrestling match with an extra grip of chaw spit. So, yeah, I went ten nine Country Honk. Matt, what'd you do? Um, I went the other way on this one. And this was a hard one for me because uh, Country Honk, again, it, it's catchy. First thing that pops in my, in my mind is uh, Homer's Odyssey, but it's all about the ladies. <laughs> you know, I don't know if, you, if that resonated with you guys, but 
I, I, I kind of yeah. got that uh, that vibe from it. Obviously, an acoustic staple uh, among guitar players. Beat, you probably know how to play this song, or I played it at some point. Um, Next yes, to a campfire, exactly, trying right, to impress right, yes. a girl, <laughs> trying to impress the ladies. Right? It's a, it's a, it's that. Practice you played, for hours and hours in my chew, and you played it good, and she sat on your face. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I started honking. exactly. Uh-huh. On, uh, conversely, I have a beholder. Uh, I don't know if this, if you guys got this. Did anybody hear a Christmas song in the back of your mind listening to the song? And look. No. <laughs> yeah, you, that now, escaped me, man. Oh you, man, I'm gonna have to try that out. Lyrically, do you hear what I hear? I, I don't know why that pops in my head, and, and it's like almost like I'm hearing two songs at the same time. Um, hmm. But I love the variety of rhythms in the song. Uh, there's a lot of shifts melodically there, and it, go, it, it goes back and forth, but it goes well. I know you said it didn't mix well, but musically, to me, it sounds, maybe it's just the way my brain is wired, but it sounds superior to me. I also like to, I feel... I feel the, the like the lyrically, it, 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 you're, it's in depth. It's, it, it's talking about oppression, and it, it, I don't know, that strikes a chord with me. So again, I, I, I did the ten nine Metallica this round, and it, this was a hard one for me because again, I, who doesn't like a song all about the ladies? So <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Pete, how'd you do round three? So uh, yeah, country honk for me is. Yeah, I love the line, just can't seem to drink you off my mind. That's just a brilliant lyric. Yeah. And I love, uh, you talked about the down-home country feel, the, the fiddle playing of, and he's credited for fiddle, not violin. That's a different instrument. Uh-huh, Byron Berline and how he approaches that, I thought that was all fantastic. Uh, the one thing that I really thought wasn't didn't serve the song was them using the honk and the, and the car horn. I thought, you know, that's British guys not understanding what a honky tonk <laughs> is. Like, it's got nothing to do with the fucking car horn. <laughs> nice, nice try, Brits. But that time, you did not sell back to us what we are. Uh, and that ultimately decided the round for me. Like you said, Matt, I love oppression, too. And this song is all about that. And I, I think the song is complex. I'm making a joke about oppression. I actually don't like it. But the only uh, thing I like more than oppression is daddy issues. Daddy issues and oppression get me laid a lot. <laughs> but the uh, I hate the mix. God, I wish these guys would have spent some money on the mix. I used to listen to Metallica in my buddy's room, and he had you know like the black blanket on the wall with like Led Zeppelin and the Police and that kind of thing. And it was super hot because no one had AC, and we would listen to this. He got me kind of into the Metallica thing early on, and it just brought back memories of that, and just. The complexity of the songwriting in this song, I think, works in this case. Sometimes Metallica is, is overindulgent in that in that vein, but not here. Here, it's Metallica 10-9. Pete is three-quarters of the way deaf and farting all the time and could still hear that the mix was funky. Yeah. Well, that's how bad it was. Yeah. So You know the backstory on what's that, that, right? Where Fleming uh, Rasmussen, he wasn't, he wasn't part of it. They, they, this is one where the band took over and kind of tried to do it themselves. Okay. Bad decision. That makes yeah, plenty he, of sense. Yeah. That makes he so was, much he, sense. He was absent. And I want to say I saw it somewhere on, on a documentary, but he talks about how uh, there, was a, there was a little back and forth between him and the band as a producer, and he was uh, completely shut off from the uh, mixing process. So this is what you get when you get wow. metalheads <laughs> managing their own stuff, you know, kind of, you know, yeah, you can yeah. play, you can shred that guitar, but... Can you mix that track? And I think this is kind of a testament to that. (laughs) The answer is no. (laughs) Okay. Well, let's move on to round four. Matt, lead us off. Live with me versus one. This one right here, um, I'm going to say it was was a hard 10, 10 9 for me, Metallica. One, iconic song. Uh, Growing up for me, it was one of those benchmarks of the guitar. You know, you, you sit there, oh, I nailed this riff. Uh, again, it presses the ladies. Um, the hardest part for me with one was the getting the music video out of my mind. And I think this is, yeah, this is, yeah. and this is kind of like what I ran into a lot with uh, this process was Metallica came out around the time, you know, MTV. So there's music videos asso- and imagery associated with these songs and for me, not so much with the Stones. So I had to get the whole 
imagery of the the metallic out of my mind and what it for me and um obviously with the lyrics are pretty blatant you know the guy's trapped inside his body i cannot live i cannot die and we all know it's a reference to the uh johnny johnny get your uh was the guy his gun about yeah. so it's a reference yeah. to that um but you can translate the helplessness in those lyrics to any of his life so any moment that you're down in your life you're like wow i really relate to this song um the imagery wasn't there for me the stone so i kind of came up with my own and, and live with me it's a very syncopated um track off the album i i, I like that I, it, it, they, they shift the rhythms very well and to me it, it was kind of a comical song the way in a nutshell the way it, it kind of comes across to me is like mick jagger's like a uh, rich dude in a uh, commune so you know he wants the ladies to live with him but he's got chauffeurs and maids and servants yeah, so, I, but I, again, with one being as iconic it is, and, and this is, again, Pete told me there's probably going to be a little bias that might bleed through. This is a bias song for me. It's a hard 10-9 for me, Metallica. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner. Or at John LG69. At the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. All right, Pete. Yeah, "Live with Me" is the uh, it's, this song's over just just the other day they recorded it 49 years ago. So it's a 49 a 50 year old song, and it's still complex. It's still got tons of talented performance. Leon Russell, and it's it's just such a great song. I, I like that the London Bach Orchestra or choir. Refuse to be credited on it and another uh, song that we'll talk about later in the album. But, the, you know, just it's funny that this song, because they were going to live out of wedlock, was controversial. And that's just rock and roll as hell. Being able to say, yeah, we're going to live together and shack up. And anybody who makes shacking up cool and safe to do, thank you. So thank you, Rolling Stones, for doing that for us. And it's a it's a hell of a song with a, with a hell of a theme. But for me, one one is what I call a perfect song. There's nothing to add. There's nothing to change. It's just a great song. I love the delicate motif that, that Kurt Hammett puts in there. And then it's almost like the rest of the band takes a, like a crayon sideways and just does those broad strokes. It doesn't really color everything, but it just goes right over the top of the beauty of, of the early stuff that, that was going on with the guitars. And it's just such a great song. I think the bass working with the guitars is... It's fantastic, and when James sings, he only adds to it. So just everything, the drums and the guitars working in tandem during the bridge, all of that. It's, they're great ideas, and it just it works fantastic, and there's nothing to say about one except for thank you. Great job, fellas. 10-9 Metallica. Okay, well, one for me was when Lars pulled back and played a halftime groove like Lee Von Helm, and I really <laughs> dug that about him. He did uh, did a great job. The guitar part is so mature and good, and this to me seemed like the student stepping up to the teacher with advanced precision, sharpness, superior leg strength. He's faster. He's younger. Yes. And then the teacher is crafty and pulling out old tricks that you learn from jumping railroad cars. <laughs> it's greasy rock and roll, and I scored a 10-9 live with me. Wow. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Little it was shocker. a narrow, narrow. and I, The whole fight was narrow like, like that. Like, Matt, I couldn't get the video <laughs> out of my head of one, and I was disturbed by that video. So I don't think it worked in their favor that time. It it, it really it really disturbed me. I just liked the feel-good uh, chord structure and the syncopation that Matt pointed out in Live With Me. It just made me feel good, and uh, so that's why I leaned to that And direction. it's about shacking up. Well, yeah. You know, you got to like that. Sure. I got to like that. You know, hey, bring your bring your Easy Bake Oven. <laughs> uh, round five is Let It Bleed versus The Shortest Straw. Start us off, Pete. Well, I, so when songs get this right, I love when a song is loose. And it's not sloppy because that's when it's bad. When it's loose and it's just you know, they're able to kind of create a different feeling because the song is not tight. 
So, you know, the piano is a little too far front in the mix for me. I wouldn't mind it, it being pulled back a little bit. Um, but I thought they used stereo. And this is, you know, an album from the 60s using stereo effectively. I thought that was great. This song feels dangerous. And I think Mick delivers something special with his vocal. He doesn't go to his normal bag of tricks. And I, I think that that is really cool. There's some sex. There's some drugs. There's some tenderness in this thing. And, and all, all in all, like however you want to interpret the song, one of the things for sure is saying, you know, like, unload it on me. You know, yeah, there's creaming on and all that kind of stuff. But there's also like, you know, if you need a place to unload a burden or unload some emotional, bring it over to me. And there's something beautiful in that. And I, I love that. The Shortest Straw, I felt like John, like this song was a little bit funky, not in terms of Lars's approach in terms of time, but just like the, the way that the song was put together, and you probably will correct me on that, but I just felt like there was a little bit of a funk element in this song, um, and they kind of played with time a little bit, but again, more, more interaction between the guitars and Lars, and I thought that was cool. Um, the bass is kind of just tapping out Morse code, and I, I liked that. I like that aspect of it. Just like it, um, it won. It's like they, they got the guitars and the bass to sound kind of like a, a... Matt, I was thinking it sounded like a helicopter almost coming in. Like, And I pictured like a dust-off flight coming in to do a medevac. And, and I thought that was a cool thing. Of course, that was from one. But we're talking about the shortest straw now. Um, maybe a few too many ideas in this song. If I'm going to pick nits. Because I really can't decide... Which song is better? And if maybe if if Metallica had made the song just a few bars shorter out of each one of the many ideas, uh, they do deliver a fantastically complex and high-level songs. But I just think that there's just a few. This is where the producer needed to go, all right, fellas, let's dial it back a little bit. I've got this one, Stones 10-9. All right. Matt, what do you say? Uh, I agree a lot with what Pete said. Um, there's a lot going on in the Shorter Straw. Um, it's another political song by Metallica. Um, talk about basically people with different opinions being oppressed or blacklisted. Fun fact, this word taught me the word uh, megalomania, which is somebody who's obsessed with that. <laughs> and I just thought it was an interesting word to use lyrically. So, it, you know, who says you can't learn things from metal? I love the drums on it. I love the drums. You definitely hear, again, that Lars, you know, he, he, he's younger. He's he's putting a lot into the album. He, he's definitely working on his calves on this song, and you can hear that. You can't listen to the drums in the song and not move your head. Uh, rhythmically, it's one of those songs that gets inside you. Again, with the mixing, the bass, the bass isn't there. I feel kind of like Newstead got, a, you know, the short end of the... He got the shorter straw, so to speak, and we'll play on words there, uh, on this album. <laughs> um, not his fault, not due to his inability to play, just uh, the inability to, to mix the track right. Um, Let It Bleed, again, um, to mirror what you know, Pete said, there's a lot of that 60s love, sex, sexual innuendo in, in, in the song. I love the... Uh, I'm a piano guy, too. I love the piano. I love it when you can incorporate classical instruments into into modern songs this song it just really stuck with me and resonated as a the epitome of a, of a good musically and lyrically a, a good 60s song so i went the other way on this one i i did uh 10 8 stones Ooh. wow yeah i had to mm. as much as i wow. had the shortest straw i gave it an eight Okay, well, you know, I didn't give it an 8, but I did give the round to the Rolling Stones. We all do need somebody we can lean on. It's hard for me to separate myself from the emotional attachment. You know, we do have our biases, and I'm acknowledging mine on this song because this is the Stones providing the building blocks for our generation to understand what music is supposed to sound like. And... Thankfully, when we have that kind of understanding, if we're lucky, our generation produces the the right uh, circumstances for Metallica to emerge. Uh, but I got to acknowledge that The Shortest Straw has a really cool uh, guitar solo with the dive bombing and shit and the bass dropping out and the drums driving through. I really dig that. I really love the arrangement, too. Uh, the second payoff of the solo on the ascending scale... That was really uh, something I, I got a kick out of back then and still do now. Still let it bleed uh, one out for me by just a narrow margin. Uh, round six is Midnight Rambler versus Harvester of Sorrow. 
blues with a happy harp and a carefree spirit and a Charlie Watts playing a shuffle that turns into a smoking locomotive and Keith Richards with a bottleneck slide, Mick Jagger chugging along and mumbling to the ladies while he's doing his fucking rooster walk. And then you break it back down and the drums just punctuate. God damn it. Yeah. You know, Harvester of Sorrow is cool, but you could put King Kong in fucking leather pants and teach him to play Eruption and it wouldn't be as cool as Midnight Rambler. It's my favorite song on Let It Bleed, mm. and I had it 10-9. How'd you score, Pete? Yeah, for me, Harvester of Sorrow, look, the songs are beginning to wear on me. Anger, misery, repeat. And, and it's just, like, I get it. You guys are dark and everything and heavy, but at some point, can we find a little love? Can you guys go find a hunk of puss or something so you've got something to talk about? You know, just The song is struggling to stand out from the album, probably because they haven't put a lot of new ideas in. And also... The, the mix is terrible in this album, right? Matt. I, it just happens again and again. And I thought to myself, Jesus, why would they release this? Why would they listen to this and go, that's what we want for the rest of all time? This is a great album. I don't disagree with but you. Think about how much better. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's like you made it sound like shit. You made Lars sound bad. You can barely hear the bass if it's in the song at all. And it's just such a shame because Harvester of Sorrow is a heavy song. It does deliver a lot, but it's just they've, they've, crippled themselves like i I don't i don't know i just i don't understand the decision making there whereas like john said midnight rambler i love mick's work on this i love his singing i love his harmonica playing and the song is long maybe a little self-indulgent but i also love how jones and richards play the guitar and and their 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 experiment with one being in one channel and the other being on the other so you have like this stereo approach to lead guitars i think it's fantastic it, you know it, some people don't like the lyrics because it celebrates rape and murder i think you're reading too much into that you know look this is the rolling stones this is what they do and they do it well this for me is 10 9 rolling stones Matt? Uh, i'm gonna jump on the bandwagon i did 10 no a 10 9 uh, rolling stones as well i actually Despite the darkness associated with the uh, Midnight Rambler, uh, I'll play on the, the Boston Strangler. I, I kind of I like that. I like that they, they decided to take something that would otherwise be negative and kind of turn it into a real, uh, I want to say classy tune. I don't know if that fits. But the other thing for this the song that really shined through for me was that 60s guitar, that, that, that Telecaster, which I assume might be through a Marshall amp has that buzz to it that just kind of you feel that like man you, when you hear electric guitar and you think about the history of electric guitar mm-hmm. you yeah. feel that i can i feel my first guitar was a telecaster and, and this song is just like yes that that's that's how you play the guitar you don't have to play a hard and fast again as much as i like the hard and fast it's, it, it's these groove tunes yeah you can't you can't get them out of your head also Sometimes you find a girl with really long hair and you got exactly, to and that and that's what they're doing here. <laughs> I, I yeah. got a little bit of. This is Pete getting a <laughs> hunk of puss. Real <laughs> sure. a hunk of it. Uh-huh. And again, I, I kind of I feel Pete on this one with uh, Harvester of Sorrow. It, it, it does sound I don't want to say mechanical or similar. A lot of the songs on Injustice Fall for All are quite similar. By now, like, too. Yeah, you know, like exactly. Like at this point in the um, album. Yeah, you'll see a shift here coming up in my uh, the way I went with this. But it's it's a dark song about you know uh, this guy. This is what I get from the song. You had a shitty childhood and you grew up and killed your family. Uh, you bottle it up and there's you go. And as far as a metal song goes and what you know metalheads might be looking for, like they're like fuck yeah, this is fuck yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. It, I got a lot again, of zits. I need a hunk of puss. <laughs> Again, I wish someone besides get, me would touch my dick. <laughs> you know, you can't you can't get past the uh, uh, the Midnight Rambler. You know, again, they took something dark and, and they made it and they made it beautiful. Uh, it's like a nursery rhyme. You know, Mary, Mary, quite contrary. Yeah, it's a nursery rhyme for children, but it's based on Queen Mary, who, who killed hundreds of people. <laughs> you sing it to kids, right? Uh, so again, you know, ten nine Rolling Stones. Wow. Oh. All right, well, keep it rolling. How'd you score round seven? You got the silver versus the frayed ends of sanity. You got the silver. I got this one I scored. This was a hard one for me. 
I went nine, nine, eight. And I'm, I'm not ten sure point. I, ten point must. Sorry, that would be a ten nine. Okay. Um, you got the silver for me. Again, it was one of those songs that musically almost sounded like a filler to the album. Uh, the biggest thing that stood out to me about the song I liked was Keith Richards. Um, everybody says he can't sing. The song proves that he can. I, I felt, and I think there's a lot of emotion tied to the song because it's about his uh, then uh, girlfriend. I think he ended up marrying her. Um, Annette, Annette was her name. But it, there's a lot of emotion tied to the song there. Afraid Ends of, of Sanity. Uh, I can't get past that the, the intro. It sounds like the Wizard of Oz, you know, the OEO. <laughs> yeah. And you know what I mean. I, I, once yeah. that you hear that, it's like I, shit. I can't get that out of my head. All I see is flying monkeys, and, and you know, <laughs> with their little hats on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't get past that. Um, Lars. Uh, Lars has a lot of potential. He shows that on this album. It's the Freight Ends of Sanity. I get the guy is paranoid. I'm not really sure. The lyrics were all over the place. Uh, it's supposed to be. I researched it. It's supposed to be about the singer who's paranoid about his band. It's, it's, to me, it sounds like a singer that kind of ran out of uh, how to throw a song together. So the lyrically, it's all over the place. Uh, a lot of background noise. And again, like I said, Lars, a lot he, he shined through a lot on this album, but on this song, I, it felt just very basic to me. So again, I got to go 10-9. You got the silver with the stones. Okay. Pete, how'd you score it? Yeah, I can't say I saw it differently. The Freight Ends of Sanity. Jesus, James, are we again going to score to the same well? Are you the crazy rage thing? I, I get it. You're upset. Maybe try to find a chick to squeeze on and crush on a little bit. You know, Maybe leave your friends alone and go make out like under the bleachers or something. Jesus fucking Christ. Look, these guys are incredible. They, they play fantastic, and that's what we always say. We, these guys are in the ring because we love them. But I have no idea what the fuck Lars is doing on the drums on this song. It, I, I couldn't figure out what was going on. He's got this, it's cliche, he's got these speed fills, and, I, you know, it just, it didn't, this doesn't hold up to what the Stones are about to deliver. And even if it isn't great, I, I think, and I like, like you said, I like uh, Keith Richards' version a little better than Mick's version of this. Brian Jones is on this recording because I could have swore that guy was dead at this point, but they caught him one more time. And this song is sweet. It, it's been covered a lot, so that says something. And I think the lyrics are great, the melody's great. And compared to against Freight Ends of Sanity, I think Metallic is lucky I didn't give him a 10 8. This is 10 9 Stones. Wow. Well. You know, I like the feel of Freight Ends. I like the scheme of dropping the last beat off of a measure to pull it back. You know, Lars does it in a way that I hear what you're saying with the fills and the, you know, but that's Lars Ulrich. Yeah. And this was him being him in a way that, you know, it didn't, at this point in the album, I think the rhythmic schemes that they used were different enough from the last few songs that it woke me back up. Whereas You Got the Silver... It's filler. I I don't like all of the times that the songs has been done and all of the. And I think my biggest problem with You Got the Silver was that I listened to it right after Midnight Rambler. And oh, Midnight yeah. Rambler is so good. And when when I was doing my Leapfrog, yeah, I went from Midnight Rambler right into You Got the Silver. And a clear uh, difference there. Yeah, You're it right. just it it just it shut it shut off my. Uh, my senses for it. So I scored a 10-9 Freight Ends of Sanity. And I hear what you guys are both saying. <laughs> I mean, I hear it. Uh, but I couldn't get past You Got the Silver being so just flat after after Midnight Rambler. Yeah, I, I found that when you're going through the, the songs, when I was going through the Stones album, I had to go back and forth because if I go straight through the album... That well, you know, what I, I typically do is I'll YouTube. listen to track one and then I'll listen to track one and track two. And then I'll go back across and listen yes. to track two and track three. And then I'll go back across. So when I'm doing my snaking back and forth, sometimes I run into a situation where I've got You Got the Silver right after, you know, right after Midnight Rambler. And in this case, it it fell flat because of that. There's definitely a thing where you can hear the uh, the band get it right, and then when they more more when they don't get it right, you're yep. like, oh, this one isn't as good as the other one. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah. So. That's for sure. <laughs> anyway, did we? The, so we all did round seven. Yep. Okay. Round eight is Monkey Man versus Live to Die. Pete, 
here in round eight, we've got, you know, and I know this was a thing back then, like we have to have an instrumental track, but first off, fuck you for a nine minute instrumental track. Jesus. And then how about a new idea? I mean, it's just the same fucking thing. <laughs> You know what this instrumental song is? It's a Metallica song. Yeah, with that With the mic turned off. Yeah. Like, did 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 James go out and take a shit? This is Hetfield having a smoke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, look, I, and somebody handed him a Virginia Slim 120. Yeah. He's in the back room working on the pocket pussy. He's like, I got to be right back. I'm all bound up over here. I'm going to get a hunk pocket puss. <laughs> What the fuck does the 80s uh, pocket pussy look like? Yeah, it stuff. looks like the unknown comic. <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah, look, we're hard on instrumentals, I think rightfully so. And this is exactly why, because you put something together. Like you said, John, this should have just been a regular song. Throw some lyrics about how mad you are and how, about how the world is over, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Pull out some drudgery. Anyhow, Monkey Man is, is silly. It's goofy. This is a jaunty fighter, like knowing they're in control of the fight. And so the Stones come in, and 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 they have many tools. Metallica brought a chop saw, a chop saw to every song. They make scrambled eggs with a chop saw. They'll make a cake with a chop saw. They make every fucking thing with a chop saw. Jesus Christ! Enough with the chop saw, Metallica. I have to give this to the Stones ten nine because they just they've got more tools and they brought a real song. Wow. Okay, well, I'll tell you, this was not my favorite by either band. So these are the deep tracks. We're well into the weeds of the album now. The Stones show off some good rhythms between the guitars, which are so pronounced, and I really dug that about it. Uh, To live is, is to die would have benefited from lyrics about anything. Uh, lyrics about the 80s pocket pussy. Yes. Uh, I have a friend who bought a pocket like pussy so he song. could practice eating it. <laughs> Let's just I, ruminate on that for a minute while we're bored so, with round yeah, eight. So, he he gotta bought get my tongue it in shape. to eat it. So how, do you, how, do you get the, how do you get the feedback from that thing? I you think know? it's it's just like doing push-ups. You're just working on muscle memory and, and uh, endurance. Right, yeah. <laughs> Trying to build up that one. Uh, uh-huh. It's like the tongue version of the tricep. Yeah. That one muscle underneath, yeah. I guess. I could do 100. Uh, but I scored it 10-9 uh, stones. How did you score it, Matt? Uh, this one, for me, this is probably... I didn't have that much difficulty at all reading this one, honestly. Uh, again, with the instrumental, I agree. Metallica's trying to do some classical slash. Let's turn on the you know the bandsaw. Let's go back to some classical. The only thing I appreciate really, truly, about "To Live Is to Die" is it's a tribute to Cliff Burton. I can't, and that part resonated with me. You know, okay, let's do the let's. Just, I guess it's Metallica's way of being somber. And, and taking a quiet approach, so to speak, to his memory. Uh, I don't know if you guys knew this, but most of the the riffs from uh, "To Live Is to Die" come from uh, Cliff Burton's unreleased uh, tracks. So stuff that he had recorded prior to his death. Um, he now they didn't use the originals on the album. What they actually u- had was they uh, Newstead learned them and he played them on the album. The, the melting of all that music together was mostly from Cliff Burton's unreleased tracks that he had recorded with Metallica. So they, this is them paying homage to, or homage, depending where you come from. Oh, you're from French, so you United should United say States. homage. Homage. Yes. So <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that, they, you know, hey, you know what? It's, it's two years after the fact that we lost one of our members. Let's pay him tribute. Now, flip back to, you know, the fact it's just an instrumental, they could have used some words. Hey, talk about how great the guy was or something. You know what I mean? Don't go out and fuck your pocket, pussy. Talk about how great Cliff was. <laughs> uh, Monkey Man. Monkey Man, I love this song. Probably my favorite song on the album. This song makes me want to snap my fingers, dress up in a suit, and drink Cosmos. I don't know what that says about me, but that's what I get from Monkey Man. I love the song. Uh, I couldn't get past Goodfellas. I don't know if that happened to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know that that cocaine yes. driving the scene and they going nuts. It, it's I mean obviously it's an iconic movie tied to an iconic song. It's in my head. Um, I can't say enough good things about Monkey Man. I love it. it it's probably my it is my favorite song on wow. the album. So a hard ten nine Rolling Stones. All right, round nine. You can't always get what you want versus Dyer's Eve. 
once again, classic stones. You can't dethrone the stones. Depth of soulful cool, no matter how fast you can play or how much you rehearse the band. And with Dyer's Eve, they clearly can pay, play fast and they rehearse like motherfuckers. You know, my ears wanted a deeply strong but less aggressive ending to Injustice for All. Like, I wanted I wanted solid closure that this song uh, had a different approach. And so I'm just going to have to go with the uh, tried and true classic, you can't always get what you want, 10-9 stones. How'd you score it, Pete? Yeah, if yeah, you know, I'm, I'm the same way. I thought that the album was going to close out strong. And, and I think the Stones really, really do a great job. One of their iconic classic songs. I mean, there's what else could you do with this thing? This this is a great song and a strong, strong closeout. And once again, maracas. I love that the piano, the choir is great. Once again, not credited by their insistence because they didn't want to be associated with it. And it's kind of funny that the Stones, they're like, we need to find someone to uh, sing this part. Hey, the Bach choir is in town. You know, <laughs> let's yeah. get those guys. And so they came in, and that choir makes that song really, really jump. And at this point for me, you know, the fight is essentially over on my card. You know, so Dyer's in, comes in, and, and you, you're like, all right, well, we're going to show you how fast we can go. We're going to have Hemet playing percussively, and, and Lars is going to go fast right there with him, and it's faster, and it's faster, and it's faster. It's a bunch of angry dudes running around going real, real fast. And they, for me, they get knocked clean out on their feet. It's 10-8 round stones. Wow. All right, Matt, you opened up round one. We're giving you the last word on round nine. What did you score? This was probably the hardest one for me. This is where you had to remove that bias. Again, this is with... Uh, with Dyer's Eve, yes, it's fast, but it shows you the potential of Lars. It shows you that, I don't know if it was the cocaine and the working out, but it, when you sit there and rehearse, you can, you can bang out those drums. You can, you can get it, you can get that double bass, which I'm a huge fan of. Huge fan of double bass. I had a lot of back and forth on this. It, you could feel the, Dyer's Eve, the reason it struck a chord with me is, I think it's the only song you really hear Het feels emotion into this. He's invested. He's emotionally invested in this song. He he's you can hear it in his voice. Uh, I almost hear like subtle cracking in it because it, the lyrics mean that much to him. Because it's it's about his own childhood, and that's his. This is his way to vocalize it. Conversely, you do have you can't always get what you want. Huge classic song by the Stones. Who doesn't know the chorus to "You Can't Always Get What You Want"? Uh, again, you get the gospel singers coming in there. Uh, the lyrics embrace, you know, the 60s culture. Uh, it's a lengthy lyrical song. I think it's the most le- lengthy on the album, comparatively, probably to both albums. This one I had to go back and forth with a lot of times. Are you guys ready to do Oh, boy. Me? Well, yeah, because you are deciding, like, you know, like, which way you went. Let me hear it. Uh, I can see you both on the edge of your seat. <laughs> I, did, I didn't go against the grain on this one. Ten nine stones. Wow. Okay, well, we have us a unanimous decision. The stones pulled this one out. I know they pulled it out by a narrow, narrow margin along every round. Um, there was a little bit more separation on my card and on Pete's than there was on yours, Matt. But this was a tough, tough fight. And uh, I'm really happy to say that it was a worthwhile listen in this style because... It opened your eyes to the influence and then where the influence carried. And I thought that was cool about it. Matt, thanks for thanks for joining us. Thanks for uh, protecting the beautiful folks of upstate New York. And uh, <laughs> thanks for taking time out from that to uh, do this album fight with us, Pete. Well, I wanted to see what Richard thought with his post-fight analysis. You know, they say it takes a real man to admit when he's wrong. So I hope... Pete, John, and Matt, you uh, step up and admit that you got this one wrong. Now, in all seriousness, this was a very close fight. Uh, my personal card after after listening was 86-85 for Metallica. And to be honest, the only reason why it didn't end up being a, t- a 4-4-1 tie uh, was I did not like Live in Vain at all. I had that as a knockdown round. While the Stones nor- you know, historically have always... Uh, paid homage, as they, the boys talked about, to um, to American Blues. This felt too much like a parody to me. It didn't sound like they were taking it seriously, and I just found the song very off-putting. 
But let's get into some of the things and some of the criticism I think I'm going to I'm going to talk about. Um, the mix, as I mentioned in the pre-fight, I'm glad Pete uh, pointed it out. I 100% agree. I cannot really argue against that. Um, I don't personally think it takes away from the musicianship or the songwriting, which I think is fantastic on this album. Um, also, you can never say Metallica song is too long. That's like saying um, Picasso was a hack because he painted the eyes on one side of the face. It just that's Metallica, especially old Metallica. You either love it or you don't, but that's Metallica. So I just I, you can't take off points for that, in my opinion. Then also in the round with Harvester of Sorrow versus Midnight Rambler. Saying that Harvester of Sorrow is too dark and then turning around and praising Midnight Rambler for being about a serial rapist and murder, eh, mixed signals to me. Um, of course it's dark, it's metal, and it's a con- it's pretty much a concept album. So you, it's going to be dark all the way through. That it, It's a thematic album. I, I just don't see that as being being something that's that's critical. And then also, never ever criticize Metallica song for being too fast. That's thrash metal. It's supposed to be fast. Okay, on to the numbers. I'm sorry, I've, I've had my rant. On to the numbers, because then it's where I've got to admit where Metallica came up a little bit short. Fascinating things in the numbers. Rounds one through four, that's 12 possible points with the three judges. Um, really interesting. Rolling Stones only walked away with four out of 12 of those points. Looks like it's a it's a runaway for Metallica, they, who had eight of the 12 points in rounds one through four plus a knockdown. So looking at the first four rounds, you think, wow, Metallica's going to walk away from it until you get to rounds five through nine. 15 possible points. Rolling Stones pulled 14 of the 15 points. Metallica only got one. Plus, the Rolling Stones had two knockdowns. Basically, either negating Metallica's earlier knockdown or negating any point, you know, two points that they had gained. So you can see what what this fight turned out to be was, I think, a little bit of metal fatigue about halfway through the album. And we're talking about splitting hairs, and, and Pete's, Pete and um, John always point this out that that we're splitting hairs here. But I think probably what happened is thematically the the album got a little heavy, especially when you're comparing it song versus song to the kind of light and fun um, bluesiness of the stones and as i pointed out in my pre-fight you're not nobody's going to win against you can't always get what you want and give me shelter give me shelter my personal favorite rolling stone song and as i've said in the past the rolling stones are one of the four greatest bands in the history of rock and roll so if you've got two of their greatest songs already on one album that basically is taking two rounds away from the band so i can't really i'll, I'll jokingly argue about this and i'll argue more to the death about metallica especially old metallica but this one was a close one I think the points, um, it turned out being 260 points to 250 points with an average of 87 to 83. That's about a about a seven round to two. I think that's a little bit weighted in my personal opinion. I think it's a little bit strong. But again, they're already starting two, two rounds down. It's, it's, it's an uphill battle. It's also a thematic album that can probably get a little bit heavy um, for ca- to casual listening and stuff like that. So... You know, hey, the numbers don't lie. I can't sit there and be too mad about this. Um, the Rolling Stones put out one of their greatest albums up against Metallica's probably fourth best album. They still looked great against it. I, For personal preferences, I, I think I liked And Justice For All just a little bit better. Actually, I think it's more of a tie uh, with, with one knockdown. But the numbers are great. They're really interesting this time. Uh, back to Pete and John. That was great. Good job, Matt. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't, but yeah when you look at the numbers like Richard was talking about, you know, the, the kind of our version of the compu box with the combined judges. We have a number of judges that kind of come in unofficially and talk. And we do predominantly find for the Stones, although Richard does like Metallica better. And he had a very, very narrow win that way. So I, I think it, um, you know, it, it's indicative of how close this fight really was. The score doesn't show you how close this was. Yeah, you know? it doesn't. I mean, I, I scored the Stones down because they used a horn and a honky tonk. Right. You know, thanks. So. But you'd have to go to the <laughs> punch count. Yeah, right. you know, you'd have to go yeah. to the right to the punch count to go. Well, this was a ten nine round by mm-hmm. the Stones, and there were a series of those. Yeah. But maybe they squeaked out a few extra punches. And if you're sitting on the opposite side of the ring, you know, or the other side of the table from yeah. where I'm scoring, it's like you didn't see those three punches. Yeah, for sure. And, and there's rounds when you guys said things, and I'm like, how do you? I wasn't fair. I, yeah. I could have added Forgot that. Forgot about that one. Yeah. 
So, anyway, thanks, fellas. Great job, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Hope fun. you'll do it again with us. Absolutely. This was a, this day gave me a whole new perspective on music. Terrific. Yeah. Well, glad we could help. We will definitely do it again. Appreciate you, man.